2023, it's our year. I don't know why, it just is. I, I, I found that if you say things like that with some degree of confidence, people believe it. So we are launching into a new series today, Rhythms Of. Uh, some of you could probably guess what I'm going to talk about this morning, but you'd be wrong. Because before we talk about intimacy, identity, and inheritance and our rhythm of life in those areas, we're going to talk about rhythms of generosity. And so I want to talk to you this morning about having a heart to, of generosity. You, I didn't put that in my text because I wanted people to show up. <laughs> and what do you know? Uh, you guys must really like the intimacy message. But we're going to do a little bit of finances this morning. And so um, I know that a pastor talking about finances, and we mention this um, from, from time to time, a couple times a year, we like to do a message where we talk to you about finances and openly and honestly. And I know that a pastor talking from the front about finances can be a little bit uh, alarming. It can be intense. It can be awkward. And, uh, and so I, first thing I want to do is I just want to address that, that some of the things I'm going to say can feel if you are viewing them through a different lens than I'm coming from, it can feel a little bit maybe abrasive or my bedside manner is not always the best. And I try, um, and, I, and I am trying, to be compassionate and to be gentle as we deliver some of these things. But there are certain things that have been weighed down on believers that I believe scripturally are absolutely not true. And so as we address those, I know that there's a lens that you, if you're not familiar with this with this place or with Living Waters or, or, uh, or with me, there may be some things that I say that seem a little bit abrasive. So I just want to, I, I want to address that first. I want to talk to that lens that may be over your eyes when we're talking about giving or finances or, or tithing to the church. I grew up being taught to tithe and, and, um, and Drew shared the same thing when he, when he shared about this several months ago. Um, I think for both of us growing up in a, in a church background, he, he said it was his paper route. I think too, it was a paper route for me where it was like my mom, my mom sat me down and said, how much money did you get? I got this much money what's 10 percent? i mean i i can i can the, the entire my entire math life <laughs> everything in the world that has anything to do with math it has to be from 10 percent. like i can figure it out if i can get it back to 10 percent. i'll go 10 percent, 5 percent, 2 percent, 17 percent. it all starts at 10 percent because from the time i was a child i was taught that the tithe was 10 percent. and so you take that money you give that 10 percent to to the church right and so i was raised that way and so i was raised in the tithe and so i'm not disparaging anything at all that my parents taught me because it turns out what they were teaching me was godly stewardship of my finances they were teaching me godly budgeting. It's important that in our life, in our financial lives, that we put the things that we desire and value the most first and the things that are wants, not needs, we put those at the end of our budget cycle. And so to begin, I was taught, first thing you do is bring what you have before the Lord and you give a portion of that with thankfulness and with gratitude and you ask him to, you do this as an act to say, would you take the, the remainder and bless it and multiply it for my needs and for the things that I have to take care of. And so as a, as a kid with a newspaper route, I didn't have that full concept, but I was being trained in what it looks like to have a budget that had God at the center of it. And it wasn't a law. It wasn't taught to me as law. It was taught to me as a spiritual principle. And so tithing is a spiritual principle, a spiritual concept I have no problem with. But for people to tell you and me that today in this new covenant age, after Jesus has completed his work, that we are somehow under an obligation to tithe to a local church and to give 10% of our finances to a local church is absolutely incorrect. It is not biblical in any way. And so it is a spiritual principle. It is in the Old Testament and we can look into the Old Covenant and we can see the rhythms of it. We can even understand the whys of it. But to look at it now that what Jesus has accomplished has set us into total freedom. And so what we do now, we do from a spirit of generosity, not a spirit of obligation. And so the rhythms that we build into our life, sometimes we have to break religious rhythms and we have to replace them. When obligation is lifted off of us, we don't just go crazy and do whatever we want. 
when obligation, when grace lifts obligation and religi religiosity off of us, we now have a choice to say, what is the rhythm that I'm gonna build into my life? What is the spiritual principle of a God-centered financial life that I want to build in, this, in the place of maybe, maybe legalism? And so I don't wanna dive too far into that. We have taught this in different places. I've written about this in different places, but I understand that as we have said, that living waters, Jesus is the absolute center. Jesus as revealed in scripture is the absolute center of everything that we are and everything that we do. That we believe in a Trinitarian God and we believe in the gospel of Jesus. And, but we are also saying, and, and so we believe in spiritual practices like generosity and, and prayer and studying the, the Bible and, and hearing God's voice and, and, and moving in the prophetic. Like we, we believe these things with all of our heart, but we also are a religious detox center. And so as a religious detox center, I know there's people in this room who are coming out of an over-religious background, being brought up in it. And so we are very conscious of that in the way that we preach, in the way that we lead worship, in the way that we take communion, in the way that we even instruct people in the discipleship of Jesus to be able to partake in these spiritual disciplines that we believe have been passed down to us for generations and generations, that they would never be put on people as heaviness or expectations, but that we would engage them in freedom. And so as a religious detox center, I want you to hear this from the bottom of my heart. I release you from the tithe. You are released from the tithe. You're released from the tithe. Besides, I don't see a lot of you with crops or animals that you're bringing in anyways. It, it, I know this may be a surprise to you, but I am not an ancient priest. This is not the temple. We are no longer doing sacrificial systems. And honestly, all joking aside, the temple is not the center of our, of our uh, cultural structure. And the, and the priesthood is not tasked with sustaining all of society in the way that it was when God was at the center of their system. And so the, the tithing, the bringing in, it wasn't just 10%, it was more like 38% when you really look at it. So we don't, wanna, we don't wanna go down that route, right? I mean, maybe we do, actually, I like it. Maybe we... <laughs> I don't know what I've been saying this whole time. I'm an idiot. So you guys need to give us at least 38% of all of your income. No, I, I'm kidding. I'm sorry. I just want to release you from that, that heaviness of that religious obligation. Why can I say that? How can I say that with any sort of confidence? Because Jesus already did it. When Jesus said that it is finished, it included that temple system, it included that sacrificial system, it included all of those systems of priesthood and giving and all of that was finished. And what Jesus has given us instead is grace to be able to operate in freedom with the only standard of am I becoming day by day, am I becoming more like the one I behold? Am I becoming more like Jesus? It is so easy for us to move towards rules. We don't have to take accountability when someone just says, follow this list of rules. Here's 10 of them. Bang, 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 bang. Follow those rules. And when someone takes the 10 rules away and says, don't follow the 10 rules, follow Jesus. And the only indicator is the fruit that comes out of your life, whether you're following Jesus or not, is the indicator of that is that you are becoming more like Jesus. But what's the rules I'm supposed to follow? get into your word get to know Jesus ask the spirit of God to rest on you that you would become more and more and more like him without anyone having to tell you do this or don't do this let the spirit of the living God become so alive in you that when you step to do something that isn't of his heart that you're aware of the check and the minister of the spirit that would, that would hold you back from doing that thing and don't cross that moment where the Spirit of God is teaching you what it looks like to live in the fullness of Christ-likeness. This is what the Spirit of God wants to do for us and lead us into, as Scripture says, to lead us into all truth. And so when Jesus said it's finished, he meant it. The bottom line is that I want to remove that lens because I need to talk to you about finances. And I need to talk to you openly and honestly as I lead this house, uh, I want to share with you where we're at. And I want to share some things. I want to share some numbers. I want to talk honestly and openly about it. And if you're coming at this with a lens where you've been hurt or manipulated or, 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 
or put into a place where it is a constant cycle of shame and beating yourself up because of someone telling you that you gotta give this much and if you're not giving this much, you're failing and you're robbing God and you're under a curse. If that's the lens that you're coming from, when I start talking about real needs and real financial implications of people and how we give and how, what a difference it makes, you can start to feel manipulated, but hear my heart. You are under no obligation. You are under zero obligation from this point forward that anything that I say other than to hear God and say, God, do I need to partner with living waters? Do I need to partner with what he's saying? Is this for me to hear? Is there something that I can be a part of or not? And if it's not, that's absolutely okay. But I need to be able to speak honestly and openly with you. And I need a clear conscience to be able to do that. I'm not asking you to give today as God's tax collector. <laughs> I'm asking you as a leader of a local church that believes so passionately in what we're doing here and that God has positioned us for a purpose, but it is not going to be found or seen unless we are willing to all link arms and hearts and even our finances together to be able to see the things that God wants us to do in obedience with him, not as an act to get him to move, but as an act of saying, God, I see you moving and I want to invest in it. And there's a difference so healthy families, we say this all the time, healthy families talk about finances. One of the reasons that, that we may feel anxiety when somebody with a microphone stands up and starts talking about finances is because we didn't come from a healthy background where finances were talked about and discussed. Your experience honestly might be finances were simply fought about in my house or it even caused my family to break apart in some ways. And so when it comes up, I don't want anything to do with it. Hear me. Jesus wants to heal you in that place. Not of that wrong mind. He just wants to heal that wound. Don't worry about false thinking or wrong thinking or incorrect thinking or whatever it is. Bring your heart and watch as your heart is transformed in healing of Jesus that then your thinking begins to change as a result. So I'm not saying change your thinking. I'm saying if your heart is concerned because of the experience you've had around finances or the failures or the shame that maybe you personally have around finances, Jesus wants to heal you. He wants to heal your heart. And then he wants to begin to heal your thinking in that area. But healthy families talk about finances. So I want us to go for freedom in this area of finances, both personal finances and corporate finances. I don't want us to hide. I don't want there to be shame around finances. And I also don't want us to ignore them. You may have noticed in your own life that ignoring your finances is not the best way to see them uh, become healthy or to grow or to actually know where they went. And so ignoring finances is not a good thing. Um, I have a tendency to appear as though I am ignoring finances, and, and especially when it comes to living waters. And, and I truly promise you that's not the case. I believe that God positioned us here. He brought us here, that we have seen miracle and miracle and miracle after miracle to bring us to this place, and he's gonna continue to pour into this house and into what he is doing here. And with that confidence, I can sometimes put blinders on and it's so important to have advisors and wise people in my corner and around us who say you know what that feels a little bit like you have those blinders on to this area we don't want to ignore finances let's talk about them and I pray about that and go you know what you're absolutely right so here we are today to talk about rhythms of generosity in our life healthy finances for you on a personal level looks like this Luke 6, 37 and 38 says, Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with me the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Jesus is talking about giving away forgiveness. He is talking about giving away love. He is talking about being the first person to step in with generosity. And he says, as you move in that kind of generosity, I will pour myself out upon that target of generosity and I will, it will be pressed down and overflowing. And this is so true of our spiritual life. This is so true of us releasing grace and forgiveness and, and giving repentance to people around us. But it is also true of our finances because it's a principle of generosity. You see, our broken idea of prosperity is to accumulate things and to accumulate a better life, right? Right? But biblical prosperity that the life of Jesus brings us into is to prosper us in the fruit of the Spirit. So many of you as a, as a religious detox center, 
even saying the word prosperity from the front scares the crud out of you. Do we have a good father? Do good fathers and mothers want their kids to prosper in every way? Would they lay down their life to see their kids succeed? Would they lay down their life to see their kids have every resource that they need to be able to do the things that they're called to do to rise into their identity? I have sons and a daughter, and I would do anything to see them prosper. But the problem is, is that when we talk about prosperity in the church, is that people have taken Jesus and turned it into a way to make money off of unsuspecting and well-meaning people and telling them that if you give more, you'll be able to pay that rent or your car is broken down. Well, guess what? Send in an offering and you'll have it. And what happens is the person with the microphone gets rich and all of the people who are simply just trying to please Jesus because somebody with authority is telling them this is what Jesus desires of you. And in their right heart, they are being manipulated and taken advantage of while someone prospers off of the name of Jesus. And we will let, let that sort itself out with Jesus. But for us, we want to understand that he desires that you prosper and that your finances prosper. And what do I mean by prosper? He desires that your life prospers, that your relationship prospers, that your marriage is prosper. What do I mean by that? Accumulating a whole bunch of stuff in your bank account? No. When I say prosper, hear health. He desires that your finances are healthy. Does that mean you have a lot? Doesn't matter. You could have a tiny bit of finances and then they're, they're healthy. And you could have a lot and they're healthy. You could have a lot and they're not healthy, but we'll get into that. So he desires that your marriage and your relationships and your friendships are prosperous, healthy. It's not about how much you have. It's about how you steward it that matters deeply to his heart. And his heart, honestly, is that all of these external things become ways and tools and methods and moments for him to be able to build the fruit of the Spirit, to continue to grow the fruit of the Spirit out of our life. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit. If you're going to prosper, if you want to talk to me about a prosperity gospel, it had better be keyed and only upon these things prospering in our lives. The Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives, love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control against these things. There is no law. We are free from the law when we are living in this kind of relationship with the Holy Spirit where we say, I don't need prosperity in things. I need to prosper in seeing this fruit coming out of my life. Joy and love, and joy, and peace, and patience, and kindness, and goodness, and faithfulness, and gentleness, and self-control in my relationships, in my, in my family, in my marriage, in my finances, in my health, in my mind, in my heart. This is the fruit, the prosperity that God desires us to prosper in, to see it growing to the fullness. As he said to us in John 15, it is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As a good father, he desires that you grow and that you grow fruit and that you grow healthy in every area of your life. And again, don't hear me say it's about a lot or it's about accumulation. Hear me say it's about health. I mean it with all of my heart. You could have $5 in your bank account and have the healthiest perspective on your finances in this room right now. It's not about how much you have. So to prosper is to grow healthier in our minds, our emotions, our spirits, our body, or our, our mind, emotions, spirits, and our body by encountering and becoming more like Jesus. Our prosperity is not about growing a larger bank account. Now, as I'm saying this as well, don't hear me say that having money in your bank account is wrong either. God positions people to be able to accumulate kingdom wealth for kingdom purposes. And if that is a gift that rests on your life, you can be in church and you can hear people always, the poverty, the poverty gospel is just as dangerous as the prosperity gospel. 
And so you can be in church and go, but I have a gift and a talent for starting businesses, for, for this, for doing these things. And I don't want you to feel shame in that either because if you get your heart right before Jesus and he brings finances into your hands, he is entrusting you to use them for his purposes. It's an honor to be gifted in that way. And so I don't want you to hear me saying that like, oh, bank accounts, having money is evil as well. Kingdom finances, it isn't about how much we keep, it's about stewarding what we have. And how I steward small things is always gonna be an indicator of how I will steward more. Luke 16, 10, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. And so it is important how we steward what we have, whatever it is. But you say, Ryan, but Ryan, money is evil. So contextual revolution. Uh, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, but money in itself is not evil. First Timothy 6, 9, and 10. Those who want to be rich fall into temptation and become ensnared by many foolish and harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. By craving it, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. So for us to spiritually prosper in the area of finances, I wanna share with you a few simple principles that we can follow and a few things that we can use as check marks or as gateways to say, okay, God, how am I doing in this particular area? Knowing that it is not money that is evil, but it is our heart towards money that can be the root for all kinds of evil that would puncture us, that would hinder us, that would undercut the momentum of what God may be doing in and through our lives. So to spiritually prosper in the area of finances, like all things, it begins with something super simple, and this is surrendering it all to Jesus. To have these moments where you say, Jesus, this is all yours, this is all because of you, and this is all, in, it is all waiting for you to instruct me in your wisdom of how to work and move out of the resources that you've given me. But if we have surrendered to Jesus in all of these different areas, but we have not yet surrendered our finances, this is a huge area that needs to be checked in our hearts and lives. And I believe it is a simple reason why the, the, the misunderstanding of the teaching of the tithe is taken root so easily for people is because we willingly accept sometimes if we are doing well, it's nice to know that I can write a check for 10% and send it in and then do whatever I want with the remainder. Okay? And so that sounds good. That's like, oh, great. Yeah, I can do that because now I have, I, I have done my religious obligation. I've checked that box. Now with this other 90%, I can do whatever, whatever I desire with it or I don't have to have that. But to say Jesus is Lord of my finances isn't saying he's Lord of this 10% of my finances. It's saying he is Lord of 100% of my finances and everything he brings into my hands, I will steward for his purposes, for his kingdom and for his glory. So if someone just said, no, you don't have to do that. Just write a check for 10%. We're going to be like, sign me up. But to say, no, you have to learn and condition your heart and posture your heart in surrender in the area of finances and ask the Lord, why have you blessed me? Or why am I in the place that I'm in? Why do I have little? Why do I have much? What is it that you're doing? I want to turn my spiritual ear to your word and to your voice. And I want to be able to say 100% is stewarded to you and for your purposes and for your kingdom. You are Lord of my finances. And for us to spiritually prosper in the area of finances, we have to surrender. But what does surrender look like as we, as we are following Jesus, as disciples of Jesus? First thing it looks like is just realigning our priorities. Matthew 6, Jesus said this, do not store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasure in heaven what did I say? Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust. That really changes it. Don't. This is good. Don't store them up in heaven. Store them up here. Right here. I'll take care of them. Let's try that one more time. 
Do you not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven? Man. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust destroy, do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there's the, there's the line I was looking for. For where your treasure is, there your heart would, will be also. I thought it was gone. I was like, where? <laughs> That's been there all week. I, I've read it. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Realigning your priorities. We're going to be talking about kingdom perspectives a little bit later this year. Matthew 6, where Jesus says, look at all these things that you're concerned about. Look at all the things you're worrying about. Don't worry about all of those things, but what? Seek first my kingdom, and all these things will be added unto you. And so when we get to unpack more of what the kingdom is, what the kingdom looks like, what the kingdom, how the kingdom functions, we're going to understand this. We're going to be able to dive into this a little bit more. But Matthew 6, Jesus says, seek first my kingdom and everything else that you're concerned about is going to be taken care of that is realigning our priorities the second thing is just to remember the source of our provision i want you to hear this you are not the source of provision for your family for yourself or for anyone else in this life god is the source jehovah jireh the one who provides he is the source of everything that we have and when we do not recognize that it is impossible for us to steward it for his kingdom purposes but whether we know it or not god is the source of all life and everything that is flo that flows from that flows from him and so what i have is not the pressure to say i am the provider for my family what I have is the opportunity to get before the Lord and say, God, would you show me how to bring the things that we need to bear on our family or on our community or on whatever the case may be. But remembering that he is the source brings us out of that stress cycle where we feel like we have to grind and we have to earn and we have to prove and we are all, there's never quite enough or whenever there is enough, instead of being thankful that there is enough, we're now thinking about how do we make sure we maintain this level of enough? And it goes in a cycle of performing and grinding and working and God does not want us to live in that anxiety place. So remembering him as the source of our provision is a huge point of surrender in the area of our finances. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks, the door will be open. Which of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? So if sinful people know how to give good gifts to their children, how much more will, you ha will your heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask him? He is Jehovah Jireh. And the last thing that has to do with surrender in the area of finances and to see the, the fruit of the Spirit coming alive in us in this area is that we would remain in contentment. Philippians 4, you guys know that I love this verse. And Paul says, I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. Whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do all of this. I can do all of these things through Christ who gives me strength. This heart that he had in the area of contentment because he had tapped into the reality of Jesus so profoundly and so powerfully that I can, I can walk through seasons where I have plenty and I can walk through seasons where I have nothing because my heart is connected to Jesus and he's the one who gives me strength. Understand the anchor system that's taken place in this simple verse. If you anchor your peace to what you have in your bank account, as that goes up and down, or as things happen that are good, yay, God loves me. As things happen that are bad, oh God, I must have stolen from God and I'm under his curse or whatever. But you ride that wave because of what? We have anchored our life to temporary provision. But Paul says, yet when I anchor, anchor my life to Jesus, whether it's there, here or here, whether everything is going good or bad, I can walk through that because it is him alone that gives me the strength to walk in it. And so this reality of surrendering our finances to God has these checkpoints. Where are our priorities? Where is our provision? And are we remaining con content in whatever place we find ourselves. 
And so that's, I believe, just an opportunity for us to check in the area of personal finances, how we're walking that out, what does that look like? But it is also true, and the reason that I wrote these things down is because it's also true for where we are right now as a church. I, myself, am having to come back to this place and asking these simple questions as we lead this church. Where are our priorities what is the places, God, where you might want us to realign our priorities? Or have we gotten off in some places? What are we trusting in for our provision? Is it a really awesome Sunday morning that's going to lead directly to provision? Is it, is it something else that's going to lead directly to provision? No, it's, it's reliance on him. But we have to come back to that place and make sure that our hearts are fully surrendered in this area of finances as a house. Are we content? And this has been such a powerful season for my life. And I can say with true heart, I love who we are and I love where we're at. And that gives me so much encouragement when I look at the finances, I look at the bottom line, I look at what's going on and I'm like, mm, that doesn't make me feel content. <laughs> but then I look around at the people and the lives and the stories and where we are and what we have come through. And I go, God, I am so content. I am so thankful to be able to be here in this place, in this time, with this community of people. And that's where we need to bring our hearts back to in the area of finances, whether they're personal or whether they're, they're corporate or communal, like living waters. I believe that God is leading us into healthy finances. And again, when I say healthy, it's just like the fifth time I've mentioned this. <laughs> when I say healthy finances, I don't mean full bank accounts. I mean that whatever God has given to us, that we are stewarding it well for his kingdom, believing that if we steward it well and we are faithful, whether he gives us a lot or whether he gives us a little, that he's gonna see us and partner with us as a good father and say, I want you to grow in Christ likeness." And I say, do you want us to grow in finances? No. I want you to grow in Christ-likeness. I hear you want to grow bank accounts for us. No, I want to, he I want to grow in Christ-likeness with the fruit of the Spirit to be pouring out of this house. But what about the finances? Eh. I want you to grow in Christ-likeness. I want the fruit of my Spirit to be pouring out of this house. But the bank account, God, I was just, we could talk about that? No, no. So when I say healthy finances, I'm not talking about size talking about our, persp our perspective and how we're stewarding it. So I want to talk finances with you for a few minutes. Um, I, I, let's, let's take 15, 20 seconds and just move about. That was, a, that was a full message you guys just got. Stretch it out. You can say hi again to that person next to you and be like, what do you think about this rubbish? All right. <clears throat> so as I talk about finances, one thing I want to share with you is uh, as we continue to do this is there's an incredible group of, of leaders uh, who partner with the team, with Kate and I as we look at these areas of finances. And so um, if you're here this morning, as I, as I read your name, just wave your hand around so people can see you. I want you to see these folks so that you can talk to them. You can ask questions. You always know that you have an access point. We do not want you ever to give money into living waters and have you feel like it just disappears. Like, where'd it go? Well, the, the Lord's using it, brother. <laughs> What'd you spend it on? <laughs> Useful things for the Lord. <laughs> so 
we often will we'll, we'll often put a couple times a year we'll put our full budget out there for you guys to see we'll put our expenses out there for you guys to see you can access those the same a lot of times uh, throughout the year we'll put the same report out to you all that we give to our leadership council so that you guys can see it we want there to be uh, trackability and, and accountability to our finances and and again that's a healing thing for folks is just to say like oh I've tithed for years and years and years to a certain place never know where it went and if I asked I would get shunned or you know, treat it as less than. And so we don't want that to be your experience. We want you to be able to, to, to see these things. But Dennis Browning. Yeah, Dennis. Tess, Faust. Yeah, stand up by all means. Let's, let's read Dennis first and make him stand the longest. Dennis Browning. Tess, Faust. Summer is here. Summer Burry is here. Tom Boyles, I saw. Jarek is here. Drew Berryessa is here. Deanna, I saw, is here. Deanna Sickler is here. Alyssa was here. Did I say Drew was here? Tanner Farrington is not here. And Justine is brand spanking new. So, is she, but is she here? Yeah, she's got, she is 10%. I'm telling you, just as long as everything works somehow, if I can get it back to 10%, we're good. So this is our, our financial council, our lead. We, we don't really, we've gotten away for years from calling them our leadership or our financial council. We really do call them our leadership council because it's really about stewarding the heart and the vision of this house and not just the finances. Um, but they do help so much in the area of finances. And, and, I, and so I want to begin this conversation by just saying this church is so generous. Um, and you can throw that, that next slide up. Well, actually, don't throw that next slide up there. Take that one down. So let me just... good. Good job. Oh, there you are. <laughs> Good job. Um, so since 2015, $3.1 million has been donated to Living Waters. So I spent it all. Um, thank you very much. I don't have all the receipts for it, but I have, no, I, I'm sorry. I, I just thought that was a staggering number of generosity, and I wanted to celebrate that. I want to celebrate the generosity of those who have been with us a long time and have been with us even recently and are giving into this house. And so 3.1 million has been donated to Living Waters. You guys know the story of this building and how much uh, of a blessing and a miracle it is. So our yearly budget is, um, and you can put that slide up now. Go ahead. Yeah, go I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Um, so... Let's look at that in just a minute. Our yearly budget is $470,000. We have uh, five full-time salary employees. Uh, we have a few part-time employees. We have those that help us on Sunday mornings with production and those types of things and other times throughout the week. We have uh, pretty large fixed costs for a roughly 40,000 square foot building. Um, utilities and operations. And then on top of all of those, those things I just listed, um, we have a ministry budget for the, for the different areas of ministry where God is leading us. Um, we have building upkeep, of course. We have outreach and we have opportunities, so often opportunities to help, whether it's people in our church or, or those outside of our church. And so when, when that's all said and done, that usually lands at about $39,000 a month, $470,000 a year. And, um, and that's super tight. That's really, really keep us keeping it, keeping it really tight. Um, and so, um, as you, as you can see, then let's look up here. I'm not sure, um, 2019, 506,000 came in, 302 donors. 2020, 473,000 came in, 304 donors. Not sure what happened here, but... Uh, <laughs> 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 yeah, you guys are not supposed to listen to me when I say to stop tithing. <laughs> Oh, no, I wish it was that. I've been saying this a long time. Uh, and f anyway, uh, 2021, 180 donors. And 2022, right in 480,000. In 2022, 404,000, 180 donors, 182 donors. So this is not, this story that is on the screen is not um, that different from a lot of churches. Um, what we're experiencing is not absolutely unique. Um, some of the reasons why might be unique and some of the things that have taken place in, that, in those seasons um, could be unique to us, but I can't spend a lot of time um, thinking about it um, and trying to figure out exactly what happened in these years. Maybe in 10 years from now, 
there will be folks with better perspective than me that will be able to look back and go, what really took place in the church that caused this dramatic of a shift? Um, but my heart and my deep belief is honestly that there is a, there is a very healthy, and I will steal the, the, no, I don't even want to use the word deconstruction, uh, that there is a very healthy place for people's spiritual rhythms and community and connection with Jesus being shaken so profoundly and so powerfully that it felt like a lot for a lot of folks and for many of us, it felt like it, it, it fell apart. And then the beauty of that is that we get to say, then how do we reconnect to Jesus, really to Jesus? If I feel like it's been religion or I feel like it's been performance or I feel like it's just been something on my schedule where I go to church on a Sunday and now there's not that expectation and all of that stuff, as people have that dismantled around them, that there is a beautiful place for people to now, maybe not immediately, but for all of us to say, what does it look like to connect with Jesus? What does it look like to connect with community? And how important is it for me to be in a group of people on a Sunday morning or connected with a group of people as a church and giving into and partnering our lives together to see the gospel and the kingdom advanced? And if the answer initially is like, I don't think I want anything to do with that. You don't understand. I just grew up with these expectations being hammered on me or my life was built around this. I don't know. Man, that is such a beautiful, powerful place for Jesus to meet us. When we deconstruct all of the mechanisms and all of the scaffolding of church and church attendance and giving and you go right down the list and now people are beginning to ask, who is Jesus to me? And how do I connect with him? And if he's real to me, how do I connect with other people who are saying Jesus is real to me too? Let's follow him together. And so I don't know exactly what's taking place. I know that we, and I apologize from the front, I think we disappointed a lot of people in how we handled a lot of things. I'm sorry, doing the best I could. Does that sound like I was being a little bit sarcastic? Yes, I was, I'm sorry. But I am, but I am genuinely sorry because as we sat, you guys know our team and this house and how intentionally we sought the Lord to make decisions that we made and to say, God, how do you want us to posture ourselves in this moment? And how do you want us to lead in this moment? And God, what do you want us to do in this moment? And here's the surprise that just because you're asking and just because you're humble and just because you're listening doesn't mean that you're gonna get it right every time. And it's not even the goal to get it right every time because it's more important how you walk through it with the spirit of God than it is exactly how you walk through it. And I am sorry, deeply sorry that some of the ways that we chose to do things felt to some like such a disappointment to them that they would leave this community and find another community to be a part of. And that breaks my heart, but I understand it and I get it and I know that we are not perfect and so I have so much grace, so much grace for people making decisions that says I need to be in a place or in a community that connects me to Jesus and helps me follow him the way that I feel like I need to follow him. Clear? but something clearly happened. And so as, and I put an asterisk right there in 2022, I do wanna say we had an amazing gift come in of $90,000 that I didn't put in that 404 and that $90,000 allowed us to make it through 2022 and even to be able to recover from some of, the, some of the shortages that we had seen. It also allowed us to paint the building and to take care of some of the things in the building. And so, um, that puts us closer to 500,000 as far as gifts coming in to, to faithful. But you do see that trend that is happening. So when we operate in a deficit like that, what does happen is that we begin, like you guys, we begin to say, what do we need to adjust? Where do we need to make changes? And this is the part that I don't enjoy, is let's pull out of savings. And so as we're pulling out of savings, which is, which praise God, we have savings, but the savings that we have has been built up to be able to build out this building. And we have seismic retrofitting we have to do that's expensive. We have uh, HVAC and plumbing stuff that we have to do that's expensive. We have alarm systems that we have to put in just to get us up to code, to be able to use the building as it sits. We have to do those things. And so you're looking at multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars just to do that. And so we've tried to be diligent in saving that money. But when there's a deficit, 
we have to pull out of savings just like you guys have to pull out of savings. And so I hate doing that, of course, but I trust the Lord to say, God, you've built a savings and if we have to pull out of it, I believe in the people that are on this team more than I believe in getting seismic retrofitting done. I believe in what you're doing, right? I, there, is, there are people that he has positioned that I would see um, be able to be sustained on our team more so than, than I, love, I would love to get this building done in my lifetime. Um, <laughs> but not at the expense of what he does in your life through the people that are on this team and not what he does at the, or not at the expense of what these people mean to us in our community. And so I wanna to continue to invest in salaries and in, in our team more so than the building. We can figure out the building someday, some other way, but it's never fun to know that you're operating at such a deficit that you're living off of your savings because why? That is not a sustainable model of budgeting, correct? Okay, good, because listen, hey, living out of your savings month after month is not a sustainable way to live in a budget, correct? Yes, okay, whoo, good, we got that one. Um, there was like two of you that knew that, the rest were like, really? I, could you do some, could you do like a seminar on that or something? The other thing, the other thing I want you to see is I just want to celebrate um, that to just the, re I don't even know how to, if you see this, but the reality of generosity is that that few, many less donors can sustain the house so well is just a beautiful miracle of provision. Fish and loaves that we would bring what we have and that God would take it and bless it and multiply it. Because if you would say you're going to lose 10% of that carry that one, if you have... <laughs> 120 donors, we're going to have to close the doors. That's almost half. So reality is, is that this is, if anything, this is a message to say, I appreciate. We so deeply appreciate and see the reality that 180 people continuing to give into this house is such a powerful blessing. And when you give, you're allowing your giving in your generosity is not just so that we can have a job. You're giving to the person next to you who is now receiving, whose kids are being loved on Kingdom Kids. You're giving to the person next to you whose kids are being loved on in middle school. You're giving to the person next to you who's receiving in these times of worship or teaching or whatever it is. And it's a powerful gift of generosity not to just say, oh, I want to give to them or I want to give to that, but to actually say, I'm giving to this person next to me that I care about. And that's the kind of generosity that 182 donors can bring in $494,000. It's a beautiful thing. So as I look at this too, as, the, as I look at this clock as well, <laughs> we are not in a place where we're wringing our hands and not be like, oh, we got to rebuild living waters. We got to do this or that. I, the, the only word that the Lord gave me as I came back over these last several months or this last year and a half or whatever is that, that, is that I am not to take on any kind of rebuilding effort and that if there is anything that needs to take place, it is simply a regrowing because the lattice is in place and we simply have to put the plant up onto the lattice and watch God do his work. We are not gonna take on the effort of regrowing a church because we saw a dramatic hit or deficit in numbers or whatever it might be. But I do believe that if we can, Submit this to the Lord that he will regrow, that he is growing something beautiful and powerful and profound in this place. And so that's what I want to invite you to give into. I don't want to invite you to give into a deficit. I want to invite you to give into a heart that says, God, you are doing something powerful here at Living Waters. And for those that are giving, we bless you and we honor you. For those that are a part of Living Waters and you aren't giving, I say this with no shame. I just want you to be able to say, does this feel like family to me? Does this feel like I belong here? Does this feel like a place where I can grow and become more like Jesus, then absolutely and by all means, partner with us in your resources, stewarding your resources, even if it's a tiny gift to say, you know what, monthly I can give $20. Awesome. I believe with all of my heart that a $20 gift given in faith is going to be multiplied by Jesus.
It is the opportunity for you to say, I am in, I am with this house. I am with what God is doing here at Living Waters and I wanna see it extended out from this place. So if we are gonna experience healthy finances, it's not gonna be about how full our bank account is. Hear me, it is gonna be about whether the fruit of the spirit are coming alive and out of this conversation around finances. It's gonna be whether or not people are experiencing heart and love and presence of Jesus and whether it matters that we're here. And if it matters to you, your family or your kids that we're here, this is not a threat. I'm not like, and we're leaving. I'm not saying that. <laughs> this could have all gone sideways right at the end. I'm trying not to turn it sideways right at the end. But if it matters, just the sustaining of this place, if it matters, then your ability to partner with us financially matters as well. So here's some ways that you guys can give. You can always get online and give. There's QR codes in front of you. You can give that way. You can text any amount to 84321 or in the back and in these spots in front of you, there are envelopes. You can just write the amount on there, throw some money in there, and we'll put signs on here for you so you guys can find them. But these little black box back here, these are the way that you give on Sunday morning. And so yeah, we don't take offering. I, um, I have strong opinions about it because uh, finances give, go up when we take offering. And that tells me that there's a, a compulsion that takes place within people where their arm is being twisted to give. And we want it to be a choice. We do not want it to be a religious thing that is laid on you in a heavy way or we're manipulating things by, that's just us, nobody else. And, and please hear me, if you're, going, if you're from another church, um, don't, everything I said is true of the place that you call home. And they need your partnership as well and they need your life as well to say, I am here, I am in, and I will give into it. And so if we're different here, that's okay. We cannot have... 160 churches in the valley that are all the same. It's, it's healthier when we're not all the same. Um, so um, anyway, those are ways that you can give. We just invite you to prayerfully consider. If you already give, go before the Lord and say, what is my gift to be this year in 2023? If you don't give, then go before the Lord and say, what am I to give in 2023? How can I partner with Living Waters and what God's doing here? We love you guys. I'm gonna stay up here for a few minutes. I would love to answer any questions that you have. Um, if you wanna talk to me, ask me about anything that I showed you, anything that I said, I'm gonna be available up here. If you need another person on the team to pray with you or to connect with you, please connect with them. I'm gonna stay up here specifically for financial questions. If you have things that you are wondering about specific to Living Waters or specific to what I shared this morning. I'm available. Our leadership council is available to you. We love you guys. Thank you for letting me have a few extra minutes this morning. Let's create rhythms of generosity in our hearts. Love you guys. On there, throw some money in there and we'll put signs on here for you so you guys can find them. But these little black box back here, these are the way that you give on Sunday morning. And so yeah, we don't take offering. Uh, um, I have strong opinions about it because uh, finances give, go up when we take offering. And that tells me that there's a, a compulsion that takes place within people where their arm is being twisted to give. And we want it to be a choice. We do not want it to be a religious thing that is laid on you in a heavy way or we're manipulating things by, that's just us, nobody else. And, and please hear me, if you're, go, if you're from another church, um, don't, everything I said, is true of the place that you call home. And they need your partnership as well and they need your life as well to say, I am here, I am in, and I will give into it. And so if we're different here, that's okay. We cannot have 160 churches in the valley that are all the same. It's, it's healthier when we're not all the same. Um, so um, anyway, those are ways that you can give. We just invite you to prayerfully consider if you already give, go before the Lord and say, what is my gift to be this year in 2023? If you don't give, then go before the Lord and say, what am I to give in 2023? How can I partner with Living Waters and what God's doing here? We love you guys. I'm gonna stay up here for a few minutes. I would love to answer any questions that you have. Um, if you wanna talk to me, ask me about anything that I showed you, anything that I said, I'm gonna be available up here. If you need another person on the team to pray with you or to connect with you, please connect with them. I'm gonna stay up here specifically for financial questions. If you have things that you are wondering about specifically, specific to Living Waters or specific to what I shared this morning. I'm available. Our leadership council is available to you. We love you guys. Thank you for letting me have a few extra minutes this morning. Let's create rhythms of generosity in our hearts. Love you guys.